of an audit committee. Apologize for the late start. We had some uh, technical difficulties in one room, and so we've actually moved across the hall. I think we're in 113 now for members of the public that may be West 113 in the State Capitol building. Um, so with that, if we could get the roll call, please. Senator Bouchard? Here. Senator Guru? Here. Senator James? Here. Senator Perkins? Here. Representative Brown? Here. Representative Gray? Here. Representative Sherwood? Here. Representative Stivar? Present. Vice Chairman Boner? Here. Chairman Barlow? Thank you very much. So we have a solid quorum. And um, we have a fairly, um, this morning, as you will note um, to the public and to the committee, it's mostly focused on five bills that we have before us and then talking about some potential future bills um, when we get into our, in our first uh, discussion. So with that, um, I don't know if we wanna start with the Madam Auditor is here. We thank you for being here, Ms. Troutwine. Um, or if we wanna start with, uh, Ms. Bodewins. Ms. Bodewins, do you want to give us kind of an overview of where we are and then we can take maybe Auditor Racinus's testimony? I think maybe just let's just do an overview for now and the same from the state auditor just and they can do it general comments to the bills and we'll take any public testimony in the bills and then we'll actually go directly to the bills. And at that time, we you can maybe walk us through the bills. Well, let's not walk through the bills at this point. So go ahead, Ms. Bodewins, thank you. Mr. Chairman, for an overview, I think probably the best place to look is that fact sheet prepared by Amanda Freund that was following the bills. So what we did is the state auditor's office sent 15 funds to research. Would you pull that just a little closer to your mouth, please? Sent 15 funds to research. Um, out of those funds, there were um, four that we look like they would need um, statutory changes. And mostly it's due to not the creation of the fund, but the statutory separate accounting requirements or requirements that funds cannot be commingled, which required these additional accounts to exist. So if you look in the first bill, um, 22 LSO 152, we're going in and amending existing statute to remove those existing, those separate accounting requirements. Um, the first two are for fuel tax funds where there was additional taxes implemented back and then they wanted to have it go to a separate fund and keep it separate and have a report that was due in 2020. So that is all fine, fine done now. So we're, we're taking out that requirement. And then the last one is this institutional land revenue fund. And there's actually three accounts, one for DFS, one for the Department of Health and one for the Department of Corrections. And when they sell off property of those institutions, the money goes into this fund. Um, the statute only requires one fund, um, but there was language that said the money couldn't be commingled, which requires the auditor's office to have three. So, um, the second bill is 354, 22 LSO 354. And that bill was, um, that institutional land revenue fund is uncodified session law. And when we looked at that, that really should be codified um, with the other, where it is in statute. So that didn't really fit into the one bill subject rule though. So we drafted a second bill um, if the committee desires to go ahead and codify that fund. All right, so any, any immediate questions from the committee um, for Ms. Bodewins? Questions from Ms. Bodewins. Madam Auditor, if you wanna make any comments on these bills, we'll take, then we'll take public comment and see what the committee's pleasure is. There we go. Mr. Chairman, Christy Racina, State Auditor. Um, so as you know, we are in general supportive of whenever we can clean up funds that are not being used. That being said, um, some of these we very much recognize are policy decisions of the legislature, so we would never want to opine on those policies that are so far outside our lanes, um, but we are, uh, you know, we will, we will close or keep accounts open as whatever these bills say that pass or do not pass. And um, Mr. Chairman, I'd probably leave it at that unless there's any questions for us. You're locked. 
Thank you. My apologies. Um, don't have the magic touch on the microphone today. Um, Representative Gray, did you have a question for the auditor? Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Ch Chairman. On draft 354, just taking this out of session laws, is there any actual change this brings to the way you do business besides the two and the staff comment? I mean, is there, which is more applicable to the legislature? I mean, is this just because you want us to clean this up? Mr. Chairman, Go ahead, Madam Auditor. thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray. Um, in short, no, I would, I would comment on one thing. Currently, right now, it is three actual separate funds, the way that the session law was written. What we can do now in the accounting system is have one fund, however, divide it within that fund by agency. So we're still keeping track of which money is attributable to which agency. So it does, it does go from three funds to one fund. Is it great follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Why would you do that? What are the three funds currently? Madam Auditor. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, the three funds are, are listed uh, explicitly on the um, very handy fact sheet that Amanda prepared. Institutional Land Fund for Health, Institutional okay. Land Fund for DFS, and then Institutional Land Fund for uh, Corrections. So we would be able to have those in one fund, but still very much divisible by agency so that each dollar is still very much identifiable to, to which pot which pot it should go in. Um, so thank you, Madam Otter. So members of the committee, this was actually the codification versus session law was actually a question that was so legal. Ms. Bodewins brought to me, said, if really all of these funds, every other fund that we have is actually in codified law. This one happens to be in, in, in uh, session law. Would you like an option to bring this into codified law so everybody can find it? not have to dig through, figure out where it came from, et cetera. And so part of this is we, we don't need the second bill. We can just do the first bill, but all that does is change a piece of session law in section two. Section two is session law that then somebody else has to go find someday. Um, and so that's what it is. What actually we do is we'd be striking the session law with the second bill and codifying it, codifying it almost in its same form. So. It's, it's, a, it's not a cleanup on the auditors, from the auditor's perspective, it's a cleanup from our legal staff's perspective so that people can find it. We can go to the green books and find what our expectation is. So Ms. Bodewins, does that um, accurately describe the conversations that we've had? Mr. Chairman, yes, it does. All right, thank you. Any further questions for the auditor's office? Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's probably more of a question for Ms. Bodewin because the staff comment says that, says that uh, there's really only two substantive changes. And, you know, I, I personally think we just keep these institutional land revenue funds separate. So if we were to make an amendment to do that on the second bill, how would we do that? I, 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 it seems like from the staff comment, you just copied and pasted this, but from, but I guess through their process, they decided to separate them. So they want to combine them. So I guess in, in statute, we need to say to keep them separate. <laughs> so how would we do that? Ms. Bodewins? Mr. Chairman, so the process was um, first looking at, was there a way to get rid of the two, two of the three of funds that were identified as institutional land revenue fund? Um, the corrections and the DFS fund. Um, in researching that, I realized there's a third one and it's the health fund and that the requirement that was keeping them as three funds was the language you'll see in 152. If you go into that session law on page, page four, um, line 16 through 18, it says funds in the account attributable, attributable to each individual department shall not be commingled. So that is the language that's requiring three different funds. 
Um, so when I took this, you're right, I copied and pasted from 152, the language in the 2013 session law into um, the new 22 LSO 354, but I did not include that language. So if you wanna codify the three funds versus codifying one fund, you would wanna insert that language back in the commingling. Thank you. Further questions for the auditor's office or Ms. Uh, yes, Chair Vice Chairman Boner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not sure if we have these agencies, these three agencies uh, to testify here today in case uh, there aren't here. Uh, what, what's our perspective on uh, consolidating these separate accounts into one? Madam Auditor, if you would know. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, great question. And um, this is our this is our process. This has been our process through all of those, but Prior to, prior to putting these lists forward and looking at these funds, we've confirmed with each agency that they do no longer want or need these funds. Um, so that, and, and we, have, we have documentation as such to that effect. We have no interest in killing funds that are still relevant or being used. Thank you. Uh, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Madam Auditor, I, so, the original intent behind these, and I, I kind of tried to go back a little bit, but I had a hard time going all the way back to 2013 to find the discussion that was happening on this. It was land trusts that were sold off. We're going to deposit, deposit them into this account. Are you saying at this point that they no longer have any land that's going to be sold off and therefore there's no real reason to have these accounts? Um, is that what they're, they've said or that they just have absolutely no use to keep them sitting out there? How, maybe a little bit more elaboration if you could. Madam, Madam Auditor. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, I, I think that question as far as the purpose of the original session law would be better addressed to them. However, in this situation, I think they said, gosh, we don't need three funds for this because this, you know, and this is, um, this entire discussion comes under the heading of dissolution of funds, but this is not really a dissolution of funds in, in that we are very much still keeping the fund, but one with with divisions within as opposed to three separate funds, which again, that's a policy decision by you all. Okay, further discussion, further questions for the auditor's office. Further discussion. Thank you, Madam Auditor and your team who didn't have to say a word. Um, is there any public public comment on this public comment? Anybody online for public comment on this, Amanda or anybody? Mr. Chairman, I don't see anyone with their hand raised currently. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so, Committee, you have two bills before you under the dissolution of funds um, item number two. What's your pleasure? You want to pick a particular, there's a motion, but let's just start with one bill, please. Let's you want to work them together, but one bill. Ms. Uh, Sherwood. And it's the so it's motion to move 152, is there a second? Second, second by Chairman Boner. And I think I heard uh, Senator Guru. All right. Discussion on the on the bill, or we'll just walk through the bill. Representative Gray. Um, discussion yeah, let's just walk through the bill, make amendments as we go, and then let's and then we will um, um, have general discussion at the end of the bill. Is that acceptable? So let's just uh, walk through the bill. Page one. Any amendments? Page two, I'm looking at the screen for Senator Guru as well. Page two, any amendments? Page three, any amendments? Page four, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I move to strike on page four, line seven to 22, because we're dealing with that in the other bill. I, I didn't ask Ms. Bodewins, but I think I think this might have just, when they separated out, been something that uh, they missed because we're, we're repealing it in the other bill and here we're amending out the commingling aspects. So 
I think we should just uh, take this out of this bill. So I don't see a reason why this would be in here. Okay, I just want to be clear. So your motion would be to strike section two? Yeah. Okay. Um, is, there, is there a second to that motion? Second, Representative Stiver. Thank you. So Ms. Bodewins, we had this discussion. Do you want to just um, just give us your thoughts and I, I and I'll, I'll let you do it and then I'll follow up. Go ahead, Ms. Bodewins. Um, Mr. Chairman, the reason I left it in both bills is if one, the committee wasn't interested in taking up the second bill or perhaps it didn't make it through the session, we would still at least be, if this is the committee's desire to remove the separate accounting requirement, that commingling language, it would still be done in 152. Now, if one um, 354 passes, it repeals that 2013 Wyoming session law that we're just now amending. And so when they reconcile those at the end of session, it would be gone. And it would, the, only the codified would exist. So, um, so thank you, Ms. Bodwin. So it, it wasn't, I don't think it was, it was actually intentional in case one bill gets, doesn't get through the process and we still wanna have that, that um, policy decision about the commingling issue. So um, any further discussion on that amendment? Further discussion. So the amendment would be to, to delete section two from 152 draft. Representative Gray. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I'm still gonna move forward with the amendment because <sighs> The commingling is really the heart of the other bill, removing that. I mean, it's, it's creating a new fund. So I understand why you might want to add that into here. But really, the, the heart of what that means is that you're ending commingling. You're creating a new fund. So that's why it's separated into a different bill. But what that, that means at the heart of it is that you're ending commingling. And, and I think that's part of the intent. And I, I just don't think we should have that in, in, this, in this other one. I personally think there's there's a lot of reasons to have separate funds, and, and this gets to the overall bill, <clears throat> and there's a reason why the legislature does this. I, I know there's been, at times, this almost, this, this strong desire to remove funds, but there's a reason why they do this so that the legislature can see the nexus from which they're coming from. And when you have an appropriations committee that's not full time, a legislature that's not full time, that can be quite helpful. So I'm still going to move forward with this amendment because I don't think we should uh, uh, we should have the co I, I don't agree with any of the commingling. I actually don't agree with the second bill. Um, and so <laughs> um, if we're if we're going to end the commingling, if we're just going to codify it, that's fine. But um, I, so I think we should remove it from this bill and have that discussion on the second one. Thank you. All right, further discussion? Further discussion on the amendment. Amendment is to strike section two from draft 152. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no? No. The motion has not passed. We're back on the bill. Any further amendments on page four? Any amendments on page five? All right, discussion on the bill. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna be voting no on this. The provisions on the YDOT Highway Fund, there's a reason why the legislature, when they increased the, the gas tax, why they wanted to separately account for those increases because there was a list of projects that they wanted to get done. And many of those projects are still in question, that's why they want, why not is coming to want to increase them again. So I don't think it makes sense to remove that. I think that was a very prudent thing the legislature did. Uh, and why I probably, yeah, you know, I didn't disagree with the increase in the gas tax. I think accounting for it was done as a transparency mechanism to say that, that we would follow through on funding those projects. In many instances, that's not happened. And so I think there's a, there's a very important policy reason to have that separate fund. So I'm going to be voting no on the bill. Thank you. Further discussion. Further discussion on the motion to a, to a sponsor. This will be a motion to sponsor um, 152. Excuse me. Further discussion. Um, so this is a motion to sponsor. So this will be a roll call vote. I'm um, sorry, Senator Bouchard, please. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So which, which committee would this bill go to? 
Well, that, uh, thank you, Senator Bouchard. So this, um, because there is no management audit committee during session, this would likely go to, um, that's a good question. It depends on what house it goes to first and who has the heaviest workload. So I, I honestly can't even tell you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. If it depends on how, what committee, or which side it goes to, and then what the uh, presiding officer assigns it to. Thank you. Go ahead, follow up. Mr. Chairman, uh, we've had this discussion about this committee and how we, we don't sponsor bills and we don't, you know, a lot of things that we talk about revolve around that. And that's what makes me want to vote no on this bill because, I mean, we don't get to, we say, we say here it is, and we don't get any say in the process. Of, in that committee, so uh, in, and that so that's where I'm having the heartburn. I mean, I, I I'm okay with even letting the bill go in the full the way it is, and then coming back and look at the heartburn that even maybe Representative Gray has, but to just throw it out there and let it go and say, hey, this is our this is the baby that we're kicking out there to let somebody else move. That's where I'm having the problem. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, and, and certainly I can appreciate that, but that's what happens to every bill. It gets kicked out there and, and the workload and the, the body, sometimes they go to the committee that sponsored them and sometimes because of workload, they don't. I mean, that's just, just not, it's not unheard of anyway. Anyway, um, further discussion. Go ahead, Representative, uh, Senator Bouchard. Mr. Chairman, I can appreciate what you said, but I mean, you, you know, I've, I've pushed that we had more to do it at that level in this committee. And that that's, again, that's where the heartburn is. We're kind of just putting a placeholder out there and letting something move through the process when we, we're, we're supposed to be the committee that actually sees where all the moving parts are. So we're kind of not in that loop. So that, anyway, I'll leave, I'll, I'll not, I, will, I won't beat that dead horse anymore. Thank you, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the fix on that point is is to make the management audit committee a standing committee in, in the in our rules. And we've tried to do that over in the House. It hasn't passed, but you know, it's something the Senate could do. It's it's actually in each body's rules. It's not in the joint rules, interestingly enough. So the Senate could move forward with their own management audit standing committee during uh, during a session. Even if the House doesn't, we have tried in the House. It has not passed, and and but I think it's a continued good effort. So back on the bill. Further discussion on the bill? I'm sorry. Representative Garou, or Senator Garou, you had better days. Senator good Garou. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. And yes, serving with you in the House was considered my part of better day. Maybe um, a little more volume on your end or our end or both ends, please. Okay. Try. Is that better? Is that, can you hear me now? Can you hear thank me? Thank you. There, thank you. <laughs> Whoa, hello. <laughs> it's Oz. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm in four. Um, I think this bill uh, seems like a good government bill to me. Uh, it keeps the funds separate, but it keeps the line item separate, but in one bill or in one fund. And in addition um, to the comments of my good friend from Naturna County, um, why it may not see why it may not seem sometimes like we're um, not a full time legislator legislature. Um, I can tell you for the last month serving on appropriations, it seems like we're a full time legislature. So um, I appreciate his comments, but uh, on and for the bill. Thank you. All right. For the discussion on the bill, we've got volume now. For the discussion on the bill. For the discussion, seeing none, would you please call the roll on sponsorship of LSO draft 152 version three, whoever's calling roll, Ms. Bodewitz. Senator Bouchard. No. Senator Guru. Aye. Senator James. No. Senator Perkins. Excuse me. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Gray. No. Representative Sherwood? Aye. Representative Stivar? No. Vice Chairman Boner? Aye. Chairman Barlow? Aye. Mr. Chairman, that's five votes in favor and four votes 
against. Thank you very much. So that is um, move forward to the session. The next. Um, uh, the next bill for consideration is um, 354 version two. And Ms. Bodewins has already walked through or kind of given us an overview of this bill. Um, committee, what's your pleasure? Motion by Brown, second by Sherwood. This, um, let's just walk through the bill, take any amendments. Um, any amendments for page one? Uh, Any amendments for page two? Mr. Chairman. Representative Gray. You got the other one. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to move. Uh, this amendment to put in the bill funds in the account attributable to each individual department shall not be commingled. And I will put that starting on uh, line five and maybe we consult with Ms. Bodewins whether she thinks that's the best place for it, line five after the word department. So, um, so I just wanna be clear, the motion is to take the language that was struck on page four of the previous bill and insert it in line five, maybe after the sentence of each department period? Yeah. I'm just, I'm just making sure I, it reads right, but after you put that. All right, is there a second on the motion? Second. Second by Brown. So Gray Brown, discussion on the motion. Discussion on the motion. Representative Gray. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I talked a little bit about why I think this is important. I, I just think we should have separate funds and I was talking with Representative Brown about it and uh, wanna, wanna move it into this bill. Um, so appreciate your support. All right, further discussion on the amendment. We're on the amendment, which is line five, taking the sentence out of, off of page four of LSO draft 152, the stricken language and inserting it into this draft 354. Ms. Bodewins, are we clear what, what the motion is? Thank you. Further, any discussion, further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Motion is adopted. Further amendments on page two. Further amendments on page two. Page three. Sorry, I lost my page three. Page three, further amendments. Discussion on the bill. Question. Discussion on the bill. Seeing none, members, this is a vote to um, sponsor LSO draft 354 version point two as amended. Ms. Bodewins, would you please call the roll? Senator Bouchard? Aye. Senator Guru? No. Senator James? Aye. Senator Perkins? Excuse me. Representative Brown? Aye. Representative Gray? Aye. Representative Sherwood? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Vice Chairman Boner? Um, Chairman Barlow. Hi. All right. Thank you very much. I think we'll probably figure out that we still have three funds. They're just codified now. I think that's where we got. I think that's where we got. All right. Um, anything else from the auditor's office? We certainly appreciate you being here. Um, thank you very much. And um, just a note for the committee and Ms. Bodewins, we can, we'll touch on this later, but since the auditor's office is here as well, um, we know there's a list of other funds that are, we're going to examine and take a look at and see how the legislature um, can maybe both look at the policy implications and 
you know, how we could help clean up some of the, uh, the books for the auditor's office. Those will be taken up during the next interim. They require um, some research and time of our staff. And I think we need to have a discussion with the auditor's office and some of those other agencies potentially to see how we can best um, accomplish those additional um, um, accounting cleanups or funds um, issues. So that will come up at, at the end of the at the end of the day. But since your folks are here right now, I just want to give you that heads up. You don't need to return for that component. I think we'll just um, um, yeah deal with that as we get there, and then maybe have some conversations in the early part of the next interim about how to proceed with those. Ms. Bodewins, anything else on that matter? Okay. All right. Thank you, Auditor's Office. We appreciate you. Have a great sunny day. All right. The next thing on our agenda is um, some bill drafts and um, for the audit department. And this has to do with the um, some examination of books, fiscal training, and then citizen actions. We have three different. Ms. Bodwins, if you want to just give us the high level overview, and then I see Mr. Cummings here. I don't see Mr. Chavez here. So um, we can maybe just give us the overview of the bills. Is there anybody for public comment on these? There's several? Okay, thank you. So just a brief summary of kind of where we are, where we've been, where we are, and then. Uh, We'll get any other public comment, including Department of Audit, if necessary. Mr. Chairman, I will start with 22 LSO 75. Please proceed. This bill, um, you, you heard at your last meeting, so I won't go into a lot of detail, especially because most of it didn't change with this version. Um, really, we're just trying to clarify and make it more clear in the statute who falls under this reporting requirement. Um, it gives the Department of Audit something to point to when talking to special districts. Any questions for Ms. Bodewins on this? And really, this all comes from page six when recreation boards <laughs> did not fall in this. We did, and then we found out that actually no special districts might actually be applicable. So it's kind of one of those one little thing, and it leads to a, um, a much broader um, implication. So. Um, anything else on this, Ms. Bodewins? No, Mr. Chairman, there really weren't any substantive okay. changes. Thank you. Other, anything else from the committee on this one for Ms. Bodewins? All right, let's proceed to the next one. Mr. Chairman, looking at 22 LSO 77, this bill probably had the most substantive changes from the last meeting. Um, and I put comments in where I tried to address comments by the committee. Um, so you would be able to kind of remember that conversation and see if this is addressing the concerns previously expressed. So the first comment I put in staff comment is um, the, S the state auditor's office had said that we need to clarify what are we meaning by, you know, what types of funds are included in this, the withholding. And so we cl clarified that to be um, state grants or loan dollars. Um, and it's not those state grants or loans, which might include federal pass through or monies um, in consideration for services. At that point, you know, it's not a, we don't want to withhold those monies. So that was the first clarification done on page two. Um, the comment on page three also has something pertaining to the deadline for when these would be withheld. And uh, the committee received public testimony that perhaps the withholding of funds should start later. Um, the date currently in the bill draft was designed to match up with the counties, the withholding of fund at the county level by the state treasurer. On page four, the committee received testimony um, requesting that the special district also be notified. I just wanted to point out that under the existing law, the special district does get notified of this. Um, and then page six, everything is pretty much substantively the same as the last time. Um, we did clean up the, I cleaned up the language a bit though, probably in pages six and seven, through eight the most to try and clarify what public officers were included. You'll see there's a new definition now on page seven, lines 19, and then over into page eight. Um, and then also just trying to make sure it's 
cleaning up what the Department of Audit needs to do, how that works in coordination with other approved training courses um, so that the Department of Audit is still providing training materials like they do, but they're not necessarily responsible for developing a comprehensive in-person training program. Thank you. Any immediate questions for Ms. Bodewins on this draft? Questions from the committee? All right, thank you. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, the last bill is 22 LSO 78. There weren't a lot of substantive changes from the last meeting in this bill. Um, the committee did have discussion in August regarding who currently pays attorney fees and costs. Um, under the existing mandamus statute, the prevailing party is awarded costs only. The existing law is silent on attorney fees. This bill would give the plaintiff, meaning a citizen who brought an action and they, if they won, they would also receive attorney fees. Thank you, Ms. Bedouins. Questions from the committee on this draft? I guess my question is, is how are attorney's fees not a cost? Thank you, Mr. Ms. Chairman, there's been case law where the fees themselves can be different than the cost of the filing and a cost associated with the lawsuit. All right, thank you. Any questions from Ms. Bedouins on this bill draft? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Bedouins. Representative Gray? So I think the request from Representative Gray is to go back to the first bill draft. It's a big problem. No, no, it's not a problem. I just got to get it in front of me. Um, this, uh, what's your question for Ms. Bodewins or what's the question, Representative Gray, comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is what the speaker was saying earlier, but the problem we're trying to address here, is it just the recreation boards or is it special districts as a whole? Right now, are they trying to get out of this and there's no statute for them to really look at or is it just the recreation boards and the others just conforming cleanup or is the whole thing a problem? Go ahead, Ms. Bodewins. We do have Department of Audit here too that can flesh this out further. So Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, I'll let the Department of Audit speak to the existing problems. Um, I'll, I'll spell out kind of what in the bill. It, currently in law, it says entities described in that 164125C. That's the Uniform Municipal Fiscal Procedures Act. And that statute, when you read it, it is not very clear who that actually applies to. Um, and so we are including these specific special districts and entities that are described in the Special Districts Act, the 1612202A, to give the Department of Audit something in statute that they can clearly point to that says, hey, look, this, is, this means you. Look, you're listed here. Now the recreation boards come into that because there was the attorney general's opinion that they couldn't be dissolved. Um, but what we really found out was that they're not actually a special district. They're called recreation districts in the existing law, but they're really boards of trustees. And so the changes you see, um, let me find, on the last page, I believe, where we go into 1612-202, um, A12, that's really just to clarify that this is a recreation board boards of trustees appointed pursuant to this statute. Um, so that's what that's designed to do. I think there was also some with the recreation districts on page five, part of the intent of this law was to clean up the dissolution language. So you'll see page five lines kind of 16 through 18. So it says the county commissioner shall seek to dissolve the special district or other entity because Recreation boards aren't special districts in accordance to 22-29-401 or any other applicable laws providing for the dissolution of the special district or other entity. So it's to put some catch-all language in so that what was found with the recreation districts is that the 22-29-401 didn't apply. And they are just, they're included in a list of other special districts. Well, they're, they're included as a recreation district in the 16 22 12202, um, but they're, that's not actually what they are. So it's a little ambiguous. Okay, thank you. All right, and we'll, we'll have the Department of Audit come up too. Any other further questions Ms. Bodewins might be able to address? All right, Department of Audit, why don't you come on up and maybe walk through anything, anything you might have on these bills? Oh. Yeah, any, anything that you'd like to make comments on any of these bills um, and then uh, and then take any questions from the 
from the committee and you're just, I just, if you don't mind, just start with 75, go to 77 and, and then to 78. Please introduce yourselves. Welcome right. and good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Justin Chavis, director of the Department of Audit. I also have with me Rich Cummings. He's our state and local government audit manager. Uh, so he manages the program that, that deals with uh, the entities that we are, are um, discussing today. So um, I, th I think the first bill really is, is uh, kind of a, a cleanup, if you will, to um, I'll say make it clear who all is subject to our reporting requirements. Um, currently in statute, it refers to um, special districts um, that are subject to 16, what is it, 125, that basically get funds from a municipality and then refers to special districts um, that are um, overseen by the courts. Um, and so there's a gap in there of a number of, of special districts that don't fall into either of those categories. And so I think the first uh, bill really just makes it clear that it's really all special districts um, that are subject to um, our reporting requirements. Um, the second bill with with let's uh, uh, let's just stop there and let's just take sure. questions if you don't mind, Mr. Sure. Uh, Chavez, uh, per bill. Um, Representative Gray. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Brown is really good on that mic. <laughs> Getting that on. Um, so how, how does this go in practice? It, it have, have special districts questioned this and at this point said you don't have the statutory authority? And I, I'm just curious. I mean, it's great to clean it up and clarify it, but it, there have been instances where you have not performed an audit because a special district has questioned the statutory authority. Uh, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Gray, there have been instances where we get pushback on, you know, what we don't see in statute where you have authority to do this. Um, so then we try going back and forth. And really what ends up happening is one statute points to another, which points to another, which points to another. And it, 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 it makes it um, difficult to clearly say, yes, this is what you're subject to. Okay, thank you. Further, further questions on this bill draft? Further questions? Please proceed to the next one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the second bill um, deal, deals with um, uh, compliance in terms of uh, timely reporting requirements uh, and then also training. Um, and so the issues we run into is um, trying to exercise our oversight on a timely basis with the special districts that, that report late. Um, so statute requires that on an annual basis, we uh, publish the cost of government report um, by the end of the year every year. Um, well, what ends up happening is, so when, when entities uh, submit their census report, part of our um, statutory oversight is we review that for any issues, we contact the entity and try to hammer out any issues. Um, well, as they come in later and later, we don't have that opportunity to try to exercise that authority before having to report um, uh, the numbers on the cost to government. And so um, the earlier um, we can get the entities to report, um, I'll say the, the higher the likelihood that we can try to uh, exercise some authority to make sure those are good numbers. Um, and so the, the entities that report later and later, what ends up happening is we just don't have time uh, to uh, do that review and have that um, oversight and back and forth to make sure um, we're doing, um, including the best possible um, numbers in that report. Um, the training side of it is, is really addressing um, what we see as the issues that lead to um, either late reporting or the findings in our in our audit reports, where um, a, a lot of times, um, particularly in special districts, you'll have people who are volunteers who are are um, keeping the books and submitting these reports, and they may not necessarily um, have the expertise, um, whether it be in financials or internal control. Um, and then the same thing on the oversight body side, where a lot of times the oversight body doesn't know what they should be doing or 
or what they can be doing in terms of exercising oversight um, in terms of internal controls over, over financials. Okay, thank you very much. So members of the committee, any questions? Yes, Ms. Sherwood. Uh, I am wondering, does the Department of Audit provide a budget template to these special districts, something that they can follow each year that's consistent? Uh, Mr. Chairman, please, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Representative Sherwood, we do. Um, we actually have the budget form on our website that they download, um, and it's all set, and it's got um, instructions, and it's got kind of account numbers that um, tie to our accounting manual to help say these are what go, goes in these categories. Um, now, there are some entities um, that have to report their budget to us, but it doesn't have to be on our form. Um, so some entities has to be in the form, in our form, others just have to provide their budget. But the ones that are subject to our form, um, that form is out there on our website and it's updated on an annual basis. Okay, thank you very much. Further questions on this bill draft? Further questions? Any further comments on this bill draft, Mr. Uh, Chairman? No, Mr. Chairman. All right, and I think the, the last bill draft is actually not one you probably need to make any comment from because it's not one that's relevant to the Department of Audit. It's a um, one uh, different a different um, policy decision for the uh, for the committee to take up. So, committee, any last questions? Um, and then Representative Gray brought this last bill draft, so we'll give him an opportunity when we work the bill to walk through that. Any last just questions for the Department of Audit? Uh, Senator Bouchard, for the Department of Audit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on the on the 77 bill draft, I'm just looking at the page uh, six and seven, and then on ending on eight, and I'm just trying to figure out something here. So if you had a governing body and some of them are elected and others are the bookkeepers, and and so hypothetically, if you have a group of people that that there's a bad actor in, in that whole group, but you guys can't figure out who it is because of what's going on and everybody's pointing the finger at each other. How would th this work out in the second? That's what, that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about that there isn't a checks and balance to actually nail it down to where, who is the culprit. And so I, I don't know, I'm hoping you see that in this language too. Uh, how would you, if you come in and look at the numbers after the fact, and I mean, would the, would the person that is the actual person working the books, what, and what if they say, well, I didn't do it, the mayor did it. What if, I mean, I'm concerned that if somebody was in there trying to clean things up and the whole system didn't want them to, they, they could potentially be the ones going down for the, what everyone else did. So that it's, I think it's a fair question. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, please. Uh, Senator Bouchard, um, I think we would, uh, do our best to um, sit down and, and talk with everybody involved um, and figure out their role in the process and, and internal controls um, to try to really get to uh, what is the cause of um, the breakdown. Um, I think that's what we try to do on, on any audit um, just in general um, is try to nail down the process, who's involved in the process, um, and how they contribute to that process. So uh, just to go ahead, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, well, I think where the, the real meat is, is because where this bill says the governing body can take that person out. And so that's where I'm coming back to. I, I, I'm worried about the, the people that are really trying to fix something, but they're getting resistance from the whole machine. And that's, so I don't know, I don't know if a way to fix it, but that's where my concern is. So, I mean, is, I, mean you, I mean, can you see where I'm, where I'm going with this? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Please uh, proceed. Senator Bouchard. Uh, yeah, I, I, I understand where you're, where you're going. Um, like I said, I, I think we would do our best to um, understand that process, who's involved and report. I think the bill only gives us the authority to ask that somebody be removed. We don't actually have that authority, um, whoever, uh, that governing body would, it, it would be um, their authority that would, that would ultimately make that decision. We could only ask. Um, and I think um, on our part, um, auditors being um, 
conservative, if you will, we would only make a request if we were absolutely certain of, of um, where the problem lied. Just to be clear, thank you, Mr. Chavez. So just on line 15 through 17, current statute says you may request. There's some, obviously we're fleshing out some more language there, but I think what you're talking about is more of an enforcement mechanism or a protection mechanism, depending on which side you're on. And I don't know that that's in current statute, at least not the, this part of current statute, it may be elsewhere. And I, this bill doesn't speak to that maybe issue directly. Um, Representative uh, Senator James, did you have something? <coughs> Further questions for the uh, for the director, for Mr. Cummings. Further questions. And then, uh, Mr. go Chair, ahead. If, please if, proceed. Uh, if I may, just a couple of comments on um, on uh, seventy seven in terms of um, what the committee may be um, looking for some potential questions. So, um, as the as the bill is currently written. Um, there would be a withholding of state funds by the state treasurer um, and any agency or board would withhold um, any grants or loans um, as of October 15th. Um, and so there would be a question there as to um, what we would consider compliance. So if we use the October 15th date, then compliance would strictly be on the census report. That's due September 30th. Historically, when we have, for instance, um, had a SLIB call us and say, is somebody compliant with your reporting requirements? We include our follow-up paperwork and the budget as part of compliance. And follow-up paperwork isn't due till the end of October. And so if we use the October 15th date as a date to withhold, um, then that, that puts a little bit of inconsistency um, in terms of compliance to where we would only be able to consider the census report for compliance and we wouldn't be able to consider follow-up paperwork um, because currently that deadline is the end of October. So the follow-up paperwork is that additional oversight that's um, set out in statute where it says, um, depending on the, on the greater of your revenues or expenditures, this is the additional oversight that you're subject to. So statute will say, um, if you're between 25,000 and 100,000, then in addition to the census report, you have to submit a proof of cash. Um, if you're 100,000 to 500,000, you have to submit a proof of cash and a, a self audit. Um, so the proof of cash, the self audit, all of that stuff isn't due until um, October 31st. And we have historically included that as uh, in our determination of compliance. Um, and then the, the other issue that, that comes into play here as well is um, part of that additional oversight requires CPA audits or reviews um, for entities, reviews for entities that have half a million to a million in revenues expenditures or an audit for those over a million. Um, while CPA reports by statute aren't due until the end of December. Um, and then the past couple of years and what I would anticipate in years going forward um, is there are a lot of CPA reports that end up late. So like this current year, we still have 143 entities that are supposed to submit a CPA report to us that haven't. Um, and that I think is mostly due to there's just not capacity in the CPA industry um, to be able to audit all these entities um, by the statutory deadline. Um, you know, whether that be additional federal funding that now requires entities to be audited that haven't historically been audited, um, whether that be, I do know there are a number of CPA firms in the state who used to provide audit services who have made the decision to no longer provide audit services. Um, and we've heard from a number of entities that they put out a, a, a request for proposal for an audit and they just don't get anybody to bid on it or they might get one outfit to bid, but it's extremely expensive. So um, when, we're, when we're looking at, at compliance um, and particularly CPA reports, um, that's, that's been an issue the last couple of years and, and I would anticipate um, being an issue um, going forward as well. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Chavez, I wanna be clear. So current practice makes the October 15th 
inclusives of maybe the census, I think census was the census report, but not subsequent um, follow-ups that depending on where they are, what their requirements are, they may have. And certainly is a different date than the audit requirement or audit or CPA audit um, issue. Is, is that, am I, did I encapsulate that well? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Adequately? Okay. So the only date I, and I'm scanning through this as fast as I can, the only date I see in this bill is on page four, and that's the October 15th. And page five has the same date for the other ones. Okay. Yep, my apologies. So page four and page five both have October 15th. And to be clear, that still only captures the census under current practice, the census, which would be the initial report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. So I guess my question is, is because all of these entities have different, or there's multiple entities that may have different levels and timing of reports available over time, is there a more appropriate date because what, I do, what I'm concerned about is going till December 31st or February 31st, and we just keep extending the, time, the timeline and funds are rolling, more funds are rolling out the door. So is there a more appropriate date or actually is this the most appropriate date because it's their first, first warning, first shot, then they better get the rest of their things in line. So does this actually help you get what you need in a more timely manner? Um, if we gave you some latitude for issues such as can't get enough CPAs or things like that. If we gave you some latitude, some discretion administratively, does this harm, uh, is this could be helpful or really harmful in a um, enforcement, not enforcement, but in an encouraging way? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that October 15th date could be, can be helpful. So the, the follow-up paperwork deadline is just set by rule. Um, so I think um, we could actually amend our rule to move the follow-up paperwork to the same date as, as the bill has. Um, uh, I, I think that's probably um, the most efficient solution so that we don't have multiple dates um, for things out there. Um, uh, that's certainly something we could do. I just uh, wanted to make the committee aware of, of the differing dates that exist now. Okay, thank you. And so um, I, I, let me just follow up real quick and then we'll go to Senator James. So do you in current rule or in current statute have some um, administrative latitude for the unforeseen circumstance of auditor quits in the middle of an audit or whatever, and then you get things get extended? Do you have that? Do you believe you have that kind of administrative latitude now by statutory authority? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe statute gives an out, if you will. It just says, here's the deadline. Um, and because we'll get entities say, hey, here's the situation with our audit report. Um, can we get a waiver or an extension? And our response always is statute doesn't provide for that. Um, uh, so uh, currently, I don't think there is anything along those lines. OK, thank you very much. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chavez, why are there so few bids on uh, CPAs? Have, has anyone ever looked at that, why they don't have very many? Mr. Uh, Chavez, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator James, uh, my understanding is just there's not the capacity to take on uh, additional audits. Um, so I know like the local CPA firm has had to decline engagements. They have entities that will call and say, hey, I need an audit. Um, you know, can you can you provide one for me? They just don't have the capacity to take on additional engagements. A follow up, Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. Uh, can they look elsewhere? I mean, can they place bids? I mean, advertisements elsewhere to try to expand their search so that way they can have more bids. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator James. Yeah, is they can they can advertise anywhere they they want to, and I do believe. Um, some of the entities will advertise um, in Wyoming and surrounding states. Um, but I, I think it's, it's really um, an issue in, in the profession in general is just having capacity. Um, you know, I think CPA firms are having um, issues with, with re recruitment and retention like state agencies are. And so I know the local CPA firm, they said, if I had, eight qualified people walk in today, I'd give jobs to all of them. But 
they just don't have the number of people uh, to be able to um, take on additional engagements. Um, but I do think that that it is at least a regional search when they're when they're asking for bids. Um, I know for us when we put out the bid for the statewide audit, um, we advertise uh, basically nationally, and we might get three or four bids. So follow up, Mr. Chairman, please. Uh, thank you. So I noticed that uh, when it comes to either local, city, or, or whatever, we seem to be stuck on. Um, I, I agree with staying within Wyoming, but we always stuck on surrounding states. I think we need to get out of that mindset. I, uh, you know, still try and do that, but let's try it nationwide and encourage that because obviously it's not working because we run into that block. So uh, we should probably try encouraging everyone to, to expand our search. Maybe we can have more than one or none on the bids. So we can have more competition. And so, uh, Mr. Think, Chairman, go ahead, uh, Senator James. Um, I would agree. Like I say, for the statewide audit, we we advertise nationally, and we still right. get a limited number of bids. Um, I think what you would run into for smaller entities is the cost of that audit versus the logistics. So if I've got um, if I've got um, an audit firm that is thousands of miles away it's additional cost to come here and may for maybe a $20,000 audit. And so I don't know that um, these smaller audits would garner um, the interest from national firms. All right, I think there's something we saw with Senator James getting to CPAs, getting a CPA and going into business with an audit firm. Well, well, you can solve this, I think, Senator James. Mr. Mr. This, is, this is private enterprise, you can solve this. Go ahead, Senator James, you have a follow up, but yeah. I don't know if this is a line of questioning the Department of Audit can help you with. So if you have if you have something on the bill, let's go to that. Senator well, James. That, well, with that, why would they need to come here if they're, don't they have stuff digital and they can just email it to the email the information so that way they can just do it that way? I don't understand why they need to come here. Um, Mr. Mr. Chavez, briefly, because we're going to move on. This is not Chairman, part of the bill draft. Uh, Senator James. Um, so uh, I'd say a couple of issues here. Your smaller entities are not real conducive to providing things electronically. Um, the second thing is, uh, from an auditing perspective, there's a lot to be said for being on site and observing how things work rather than being remote and just looking at pieces of paper. Um, it, you add to digital documents add an increased risk of um, fraud because they're easier to manipulate than original paper source documents. So there's a couple issues there. Um, I think you, you, at least I as an auditor would be hesitant to be 100% remote on something um, just because it's, it's difficult to really get a sense of internal controls if you're not there on site being able to observe um, the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Travis, just quick question. The, the audits that we're talking about, I, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're not requesting something at a state level that's not required by GAP or GASB. Is that correct? Uh, so, Mr. Please Chairman, proceed. Uh, Representative Brown, so the audits are um, financial statement audits. So, um, financials in accordance with GAP, yes. Okay. Further questions for the department? Further questions for the department? All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to provide the committee um, some information with respect to what Mr. Chavez said. Okay, um, please proceed. It, uh, there, in the previous bill draft version at your last meeting had a staff comment that pointed out that this bill, the withholding of funds is only applicable to that 9-1-507A7, which is what you're seeing um, in, the, in the bill draft. If, if we wanted to move the date back to include some of these additional reports, we would need to expand the language in the bill. Um, and I haven't had time to really think about that, but it would have to include perhaps all reports due to the Department of Audit under 9-1507 or something broader. It doesn't even include the, currently doesn't include the audit requirements. Okay, thank you very much. So members, just so you're, we're clear of what I understood Ms. Bodewins to say is, 
if we're going to change the date from the October 15th, which is on page four and page five, it would require more or more research and potentially more alterations in statute beyond this bill and probably put this bill off from for this session. So, well, which Chair, I'm not saying is the end of the word. Um, Ms. Bodewins and then Representative Stiver. Ms. Bodewins. Just to add a, a little bit to what you just restated, you can still move the date back, but I think it would be meaningless in terms of the other additional reports that they're talking okay. about. All right. Because you could still only withhold the funds for the. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Stiver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The director just said that they could move them dates in rules to match up with this date. Is that correct there? On the October 15th date, you, you just stated that you could move your dates within your rules uh, to match up with the October 15th. Director, if you'd come back, come back up. Um, so the question from Representative Stivar is, you made a reference to being able to adjust rules um, and some of the other re uh, subsequent reporting dates or timeline dates. So would you just clarify that? I think that's the, the genesis of Representative Stiver. October 15th is in the bill. You have other dates that you spoke about, but those are not statutorily set. Those are set by rule. So would you just clarify that for, uh, for, the, for the committee, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Stivar, yes. The, the due date for the follow-up paperwork um, is set by rule. And so we could um, amend our rule to move that date and make it consistent with the date in the bill. Okay, thank you. Further follow up, okay. Yes, Ms. Sherwood, Representative Sherwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. What if we took the date out and just said for a special district that was non-compliant, what would that do? Mr. Chavez. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Sherwood, um, I think then that would leave us with the statutory date of September 30 for the census reports to be submitted. Um, and then the follow-up paperwork, I think would leave it at what our rule says at, at October 31st would be my thought off the top of my head. So taking the day out actually shortens the time 15 days was it what I just heard from the October 15th to September 30th as the census date. Uh, so I, I think uh, my thoughts would be there would be two dates in play, the, the September 30th for the census and then the October 31st for the follow-up paperwork. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, instead of taking the date out, you could perhaps set that, make the statute read that, um, the withholding of funds shall begin 30 days after any due, any report is due that hasn't been submitted and you could add in the waiver authority for the Department of Audit if they can't obtain a CPA firm. You can make it a temporal day thing versus a set date. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bodwins, for the suggestion. What I, what I guess my, my question of that is, and then it sounds like we have multiple deadline dates depending on the requirements of the different entities. So we have September 30th, October, something then into December. So we'd have multiple timelines. So I think that's probably at least my view. Thank you for the suggestion, but I don't know that we wanna get that um, complex both for the department and for the auditor's office and the treasurer's office and for this committee, quite honestly. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the question, Rep. Dave Sherwood. We'll not have another one like that. <laughs> no, we thank you. No, I think it is important because we are getting into some of the nuance of this of this issue. Further questions for the for the director. Further questions, um, Ms. Bodwins, Is there anybody online to testify to any of these three bills? Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chavez. Mr. Chairman, nobody has their hand raised. I know um, some of the representatives from WAMCAT and the Special District Association are available. Okay. Anybody in the room for public comment? Yes. Wyoming County Commissioners Association, Mr. Jeremiah Riemann. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments brief here. I did want to provide the committee with just a little bit of an update relative to some of the dissolutions uh, that are in process uh, uh, for your edification. So 
uh, I have a copy of the department's uh, report of uh, non-compliant special districts. Uh, it, it is positive to see that four of the entities have completed their reporting. Uh, so as I understand it, they are now in compliance. Uh, there are an additional five uh, that have been dissolved, uh, one in Campbell County, uh, four uh, in Washakie County. Uh, and I apologize, there's actually a sixth, uh, one of those in uh, Lincoln County. There are two remaining districts in uh, Natrona County uh, that are in the final process of being dissolved. So on January 4th, uh, the commissioners there finalized resolutions to dissolve uh, those two districts. Uh, and uh, on the 18th of this month, uh, they uh, passed a resolution with their findings of fact uh, relative to the dissolution, just essentially stating what the process has been to get to this point. I've been advised by the Natrona County Commissioners that those two entities will be dissolved in February. Uh, so that will resolve, as I see it, every single one of the entities that is listed on the report at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have a couple of comments uh, relative to a couple of the bills here. Um, and, and just to be clear, out at the gate. Um, let's let's yeah, take sure. you, um, on your update on the dissolution. Let's just take a couple of questions on yeah. that. We do thank you for that update. Uh, Representative Gray had a question there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Riemann, sorry, this mic here is, um, it's, it's, we're having issues turning it on, or I am. Uh, you said there was a handout on this, or was you, did you email this? I, I just, it's useful info. So was there a written version of that, or is there any chance you could email it? If, it, it's, if it's a lot of work to type it up, no problem. But. Mr. Riemann go, Riemann, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Gray, it's actually just a letter from uh, the Department of Audit. I've got an electronic copy that I can send the committee after this. If you would, uh, yeah, provide it to Ms. Bodewins or um, provide it to Ms. Bodewins and she'll get it, make it part of both our, our record, the record of the meeting, and then get it to us as well. That would be helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Happy to. Mr. Chavez, did you have some? Okay. Okay, for the members of the public who couldn't hear the comments from uh, Mr. Chavez, director of the, um, the uh, this, this report is part of their cost of government report. It's available publicly on their website. We will also put it on our, as our meeting materials or a link to it so that folks can access it based on the testimony that was provided this morning. Thank you, Representative Gray. Thank you. Uh, please proceed, Jeremiah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as it relates to the bills, as I speak to them, I want to be pretty clear out of the gate. Uh, my association has not established a position on any of these bills. Just want to provide a couple of comments uh, uh, to them. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, 22 LSO uh, 75. And in particular, I'm on page five. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, as I read uh, these changes, um, in particular, uh, the addition of the other entity language, I believe that captures small municipalities. Uh, now, uh, for my members, I don't know where they're gonna come out on this, but uh, I suspect there may be some reticence to wanna be involved in uh, uh, the responsibility for dissolving a municipality. Uh, and so I would just point to you as that's a, a place for uh, some consideration in the conversation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the next piece is uh, relative to the language that's added on line 17 and 18. Uh, as the director uh, noted, if you go into the dissolution statutes of every single one of the special districts or uh, other entities, including the towns, they're all different. They're all different from what you find in 22-29-401. Um, so, I'm a little concerned by adding that language that my commissioners are going to have one more uh, uh, you know, legal conundrum to be going through as they look at what's in 22-29-401, as well as all those others. If you go into, for example, the dissolution of a small municipality, 
uh, it, it has a specific process, but it doesn't talk about uh, the commissioners necessarily in that. So I don't know what the utility is of adding in sort of a catch-all. Now I may be wrong, but but uh, admittedly, as you go into any of these special districts, they're all established differently. They're all governed differently. Commissioner responsibilities over their budget uh, is different or doesn't exist whatsoever. So. Uh, I, I'm just worried about uh, the complication uh, that that might add for the legal staff as they try and dissolve uh, these special districts as required by law. That's, uh, that's what I'll uh, mention uh, relative to that. I don't know that we have any issue relative to any of the other provisions of adding other entity in the other parts of that uh, provision on page five. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have any specific comments to uh, 22 LSO uh, 77. Um, obviously, it, it appears that counties, in particular, other elected officials other than commissioners, would be uh, certainly subject to this, and we'll gather their input as we develop our positions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll just end on 22 LSO 78. Uh, I think you've done a lot of good work uh, to ensure compliance, both through the county commissioners working with the Department of Audit, uh, adding in the provision of withholding uh, funds uh, from the state level, uh, which I don't know uh, that that's going to create a problem for, for counties. And I don't even know if this particular bill will be uh, at issue, but I do question whether we need another statute that simply, simply and from my perspective, appears to line the pockets of lawyers uh, who are going to go after entities that uh, are non-compliant uh, and are going to be subject to other pressures to get their reports in. So I only question its utility uh, uh, in really trying to drive compliance, uh, but beyond that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for questions. Thank you, Representative Brown. Questions, for Mr. Raymond? Just a quick question, and I'm 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 not sure if there is any situation, but do you know of any special districts that would fall underneath this that straddle more than one county line? Um, and what I'm after hearing you talk about, you know, these county commissioners having uh, the say so over the possible dissolution of these particular special districts. My concern is is if you have one commission group that says, okay, yeah, we're, we're approving this and we're going forward. And then another one that says the exact opposite. I, I don't know if that's the case, but are you aware of any special districts that straddle county lines that this may become an issue? Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, there are special districts that cross uh, uh, county lines. In fact, we've got a, a water special district in the Bighorn Basin that crosses four county lines, as I understand it off the top of my head. I don't know how this all interplays with the particular statutes there, but yes, we do have special districts across uh, uh, county lines. Thank you. Further questions? Further questions? Thank you very much. Any other public testimony? Any other public testimony? Anybody online, Ms. Bodewins? Or Amanda, sorry, I don't know who's monitoring online. My apologies, Carla. No, Mr. Chairman, no one okay. has their hand raised. No one hands are raised. And then I have a question for Ms. Bedwins. All right, Representative Gray has a question for staff. It's Brown. Or Brown, sorry. <laughs> Somebody push a button. It's the other neutral color, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bedwins. That's I pretty good. I like that. <laughs> well done. Well played. <laughs> Um, just a quick question in, in regards to if we, if we follow the, the way the law is written here and it says um, the county commissioner shall seek, she, seek to dissolve the special district or any entity according with 22-29-401. In, in the case that we have a water district that spreads over four counties, who would be then responsible for that? If we have multiple chairs and multiple areas within that special district, who would ultimately be responsible to file that paperwork? And would this be a situation that could be, well, we're not responsible for it, we're not responsible for it, and it would just be kind of a, a mess all over again. Does this actually solve what we're trying to solve? Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, um, I think there, it is a little unclear. Um, 
some of those water districts that are spanning multiple counties could actually be irrigation districts, which are governed under the court. Um, so that could be one solution is the county themselves, various counties are not actually in charge of those districts. Now, if there are other districts that are, are across multiple counties, which I, I don't know those, I don't know what their governance is. I'd have to look at those specifically to really answer that question. Um, but yeah, there might be an issue where there could be finger pointing as to who is, uh, has the ultimate authority. So just to be clear, Representative Brown, the, the new language in question is line 17 and 18. The new language on line 17 and 18, is that accurate? Of page five, one of 75, okay, thank you. Um, any further questions on any of these bills for any of the public testifiers or Ms. Bodewins? Seeing that? All right, committee, let's just do them in numerical order if that is um, acceptable for you. So committee, what's your pleasure on draft 0075.6? Examination of books in certain districts and entities. Motion by Gray. We have a second. Second, second by Senator Bouchard. All right, we'll walk through the bill for any amendments, and then we'll take any comment, committee comment on the bill, and do a roll call. Any amendments on page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page six is the last page. So seeing no amendments on the bill, um, discussion on the bill. Discussion on the bill. Senator Boner, Vice Chairman. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I think if the committee does move forward with the bill draft, maybe we could look forward to an amendment that suggests something specific from the county commissioners that would alleviate their concerns. I don't see it as a reason to trip up the bill though. Thank you very much. And I actually concur with that, and we'll we'll do some work to make sure we're not crossing authorities or crossing lines and putting the county commissioners dissolving um, small towns in Wyoming or responsible for that in some way. That would be um, awkward. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, or school districts. My goodness, that would get even more interesting. Um, I didn't. Yeah. Um, any, any further discussion on the bill? Further discussion on the bill? So members, we are voting on the motion to sponsor LSO 0075.6, examination of certain books and certain, or books in certain districts and entities as a bill for the upcoming session. Please call the roll. Senator Bouchard. Senator Guru? Aye. Senator James? Aye. Senator Perkins? Aye. Representative Brown? Aye. Representative Gray? Aye. Representative Sherwood? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Vice Chairman Boner? Aye. Chairman Barlow? Aye. So thank you, committee members. We have adopted that one as a to forward to the session. Next bill for consideration is 0077, working draft 0 0.7. What's your pleasure? Move the bill. Moved by Brown, seconded by Representative Gray. All right, let's um, walk through the bill. Any amendments on page one? Amendments, page Two. Amendments page two. Um, so members, I'm going to ask for you to consider an amendment. And this goes to the staff comment 
on top of page three where the staff has talked about require versus verify. Um, and so this on line two, and this is actually a little more complex than that. And I'd, I'd like to make the motion if there's a second, then I'll explain it. So on line 13, the it would read, board shall strike, require, insert, verify. So it's, it now reads, board shall verify that all insert applicants and before recipients, and then on line 14, um, after loans are in compliance, strike, comply. So the new language would read, I'm gonna read the entire beginning of that sentence. All state agencies and boards shall verify that all applicants and recipients of state grants and loans are in compliance with the applicable reporting requirements required under da, 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 da. Well, That's my motion. Second by Sherwood. So if I could, I'll just explain real quickly. What we're, what the way I read this sentence in its current form is we're saying you're going to get your grant and you need to, and part of that grant is you're going to stay in compliance. What I want, what I believe this committee is interested in is that, that they are already in compliance with the past grants. They already have met the audit requirements before they receive an additional one or before they get another one. So that's what I'm trying to do with this is the verification that when somebody applies, they can go to the Department of Audit and say, are they in compliance or not? And if they're not in compliance, then they would not be eligible for those grants. That's how I'm trying to get to it. And I apologize when I was, I've read this numerous times and I knew it didn't quite do what I wanted. And I finally figured out after I read the staff comment, the verify department, the verify is for actions that have already taken place. The require is something that is going forward in my, at least the way I interpret it. So that's my motion. Thank you for the second discussion on the motion. Representative Brown. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have, I agree with what you're trying to do. My only concern is thinking back to where it says all state agencies and boards shall require, and then you add in applicants. The only way to enforce that would be to add some level of documentation as they're doing an application that verifies that. Um, I don't have a problem with it being just a recipient. So before they actually receive anything, um, they would have to verify that that's good. But verifying before they put in an application seems, excuse me, seems maybe a little bit overburdensome for any application going forward. So I'm wondering if, it, more discussion certainly, but um, my thought on this is, we're adding an extra layer of complexity to something that's going on here when the only person that really we need to worry about is the person that's actually going to be receiving the money at the end. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take more questions or comments and then I'll try to respond. Go ahead, Senator Boner. Well, just response to that, Mr. Chairman, I thought the point of the bill was to ensure compliance with these already existing um, entities which are supposed to be doing it anyway. So, uh, Representative Brown is correct. It does uh, expand the scope of the bill. I think that's a good. I think that's in accordance with the intent of the legislation. So I could definitely support the amendment as is. Further, further discussion on the amendment. Further discussion. So, so to clarify, I don't even want people to bother applying if they're not in compliance. I shouldn't say bother. I want them to come into compliance. So when they apply, they don't. That isn't an issue. And that's where I guess, I, that's where I guess I am personally at. Now, maybe the language isn't clean enough. And I don't know, Ms. Bodewins, do you wanna make any comment if you were able to get, get that language um, down? Does it, is it clean enough? Does it need some cleanup? Should I give you a little more, a little latitude to clean it up? Mr. Chairman, listening to what your intent is, I think the language is fine. Okay, so, um, so anyway, so, Further discussion on the amendment? Further discussion? 
So all those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Okay, the amendment is adopted. And I apologize, committee. I, I should have had it something like this. I should have had a something written out for you and handed it to you. And I just, I finally figured out what I think I wanted to do. And thank you for that consideration. Um, further discussion on page two, amendments on page two. Amendments on page three. Amendments on page three. Amendments on page four or five. And I'm throwing four and five together because four and five are basically duplicative language. One applying to cities, towns, counties, and the other two um, special districts and other entities. So it's very, it's, it's basically a mirror for the two different entities. I wish we could actually condense it down into having one paragraph, but I, I know Ms. Motowitz did that intentionally. So um, any discussion there? This is where the October 15th date is on page four and page five, if anybody has any interest in that. Further, any amendments on those two pages? Amendments on page six. Amendment on page six. Thing none, maybe seven, page seven. Page eight. There is a staff comment here, just point you to that. Um, this has to do with the, re the reporting or the uh, training requirements. Further discussion on any amendments, page eight. All right, any amendments, any comments on the bill? Committee? Amendments, comments on the bill? Seeing none, question on the bill being called. Ms. Bodens, would you please call roll for introduction for uh, sponsorship and introduction of 0077 0.7 fiscal training enforcement of fiscal reporting laws as amended. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we received a request um, via email that members turn their mics on when they vote. The vote's not being heard on the YouTube. So what's the question? Um, reminder just to turn your mic. Oh, on when, when you, you vote. vote. Okay. So members, when you're when you do vote, please um, just key your mic because we don't have a room mic, which we're working on for our chambers as well. Um, but please, uh, please proceed, Ms. Bodwins. Senator Bouchard. Aye. Senator Guru. Aye. Senator James. Aye. Senator Perkins. Excuse. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Gray. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Aye. Representative Stivar. Aye. Vice Chairman Boner. Aye. Chairman Barlow. Aye. Thank you very much. Next bill for our consideration is LSO 0078.05. Representative Gray, would you like to make any comments on this bill or would you like just to move the bill? Your uh, pleasure. I'll move the bill. Thank you. Okay, there's a motion on 078. Is there a second? Representative Stivar is a second. Um, let's walk through the, that's just uh, any amendments on the bill. Page one, page two. Page two, page three. There's a staff comment there, but page three, any discussion on the bill? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, any amendments? Any amendments on the bill? Discussion, Representative Gray, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These changes, these mandamus actions have proved to be quite effective in instances where there's not compliance. And, and we've heard numerous testimony. And for those that have been here you know, since, since 2019, we've, we've heard over the years the, the struggles in getting compliance on a lot of these reporting mechanisms, and it can be frustrating. These mandamus actions are another tool. So at the end of the day, if something's filed and um, they just need to comply and then the the case is withdrawn and there's no attorney's fees so that that provision only gets triggered when it if it goes to if the court ultimately takes an action and that means that somebody's not complying even after a mandamus action is filed so that that's a pretty serious deal once you get to that point so, I mean, just to respond to the earlier point that was made, if, if a district is not complying 
and somebody files one of these mandamus actions, and, and surely the attorney will send a letter before. I, I think that's reasonable to assume that. But even if they didn't, they will have the ample time to comply, especially with the backlog in the judiciary. And at that point, the case is moved. I mean, they just withdraw, the, the, the court will withdraw the case once they comply. So that, that provision is only there if you get some sort of district or situation where there's just, there's even after a letter's filed, numerous re verbal requests, a mandamus action's filed, it's still going before a judge. And that's something that's probably going to take in, in the status of where we are in the backlog, probably over a year in, in most judicial districts in the state of Wyoming at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill draft? <clears throat> Further discussion. Further discussion on the bill draft. Seeing none. So, uh, Ms. Bodewins, if you would um, call the roll on LSO 0078.0.5 for um, sponsor introduction and sponsorship. Sponsorship and introduction. Please. Mm -hmm. And members, again, remember to key your mics so they, uh, the vo your vote can be heard. Please proceed, Ms. Bodewins. Senator Bouchard? Aye. Senator Guru? No. Senator James? Aye. Senator Perkins? Excuse me. Representative Brown? Aye. Representative Gray? Aye. Representative Sherwood? No. Representative Stivar? Aye. Vice Chairman Boner? Aye. Chairman Barlow? No. So the bill is adopted. It was adopted. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're at five bills down. Five bills down. And I'm, I'm shocked that we don't have a break on this schedule. Um, but we're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, and we don't have. Um, so thank you very much to our um, Department of Audit for being here. Appreciate you. Um, Ms. Bodewins, is there any we don't have our department of, uh, actually we did not anticipate these bills moving that quickly. So I thank you for the efficiency of the, we actually thought there'd be quite a more public comment when we set these times out because um, we certainly had it in our previous meetings with different agent entities. So uh, my apologies not being more, um, I guess, more, more accurate. Um, state leasing certainly can't do that. Miss. Bodewins, all the rest of these require folks from other places, and we're not going to do that. So, Ms. Bodewins, how about we go to our um, number nine, and we just work through that issue, um, and then we, we don't, we, I just get an update on that issue, take questions, answers, and we can do any final actions at the end of the day. Would that be acceptable for you? Mr. Chairman, I think that works. And that'll utilize our time a little better this morning. Hopefully, we can use get some of that out of the way, and then we'll take a a lunch at time. Mr. Vice Chairman, is that acceptable for you? Okay. Ms. Bodewins, if you don't mind, just so members of the public and members of the committee, we're going to go to our 345 um, time slot, which is number nine on our agenda is prioritization of staff directives. And we're going to get an update on various items that our staff has already worked on. And then we have a couple items on here that have been brought to the attention of the uh, chairman and to the committee of things we may, um, other things we may want to uh, look into. We'll also have a little bit of an overview of kind of what our staff has ahead of them during the session and then post session as far as um, how we should be considering um, tasking them, the workload they have for them. So uh, Ms. Bodewins, as, as however you see fit with your staff, uh, please walk us through um, number nine on our agenda. Thank you. Um, actually, yeah, let's do that. Let's take a uh, let's take a ten minute break. So we'll reconvene at ten thirty, and um, we'll do that. So we're in recess until ten thirty. Thank you very much.
Hello. All right, committee, let's come back to order. Thank you very much for the, your uh, diligence this morning and the work. Thank you, the Department of Audit, County Commissioners, State Auditor's Office, um, for helping us get through uh, five bill drafts this morning. So now we're going to turn to, which is item number eight, nine, excuse me, on our agenda um, as we're ahead of schedule and we'll take care of some of the um, items um, that would be at the, normally at the end of the day, where we'll get some updates from our staff. So I think Ms. Carla is up maybe first or she's in the middle, so she gets the short stick. Um, so please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Carla Smith. I'm senior program evaluator, and I'm here with our, our evaluation team, and we're going to update you on where we're at on the state, Wyoming state contracting evaluation. So we'll see if I can do the slides while doing this. So um, my team is comprised of Clarissa Nord. She's an associate research analyst and Amanda Freun, who is um, Associate Program Evaluator. Uh, we're also going to have some assistance from another staff member in research to assist us with cleaning up some data and helping us with the data compilation. Um, we're currently in the um, finishing up the planning and scoping phase. The staff, um, we've conducted the background data on the Wyoming contract processes. We've conducted the entrance conference with the three engaged agencies. Those agencies are the Department of A&I, the Department of ETS, and the Attorney General's Office. Um, we've met with um, other A&I and ETS staff and officials regarding their data systems and obtaining that data. We've conducted a number of interviews with other stakeholders as well. Um, we've been researching currently um, best practices for contracting in states. And um, based on the data we have so far, we're working to develop the appropriate methodology um, for a contract sample. And we'll do a case file review with that contract sample. Um, we have uh, reviewed the initial information and document requests that we sent out to the three entities that we engaged. And uh, we've received, to date, we've received the full responses from ANI and ETS. Um, we're still um, awaiting some responses from the AG. Um, they've um, declared that a lot of what we're asking for is uh, privileged communication. It's a uh, work um, a client attorney privilege communication, but we're working with them to obtain that. And so they should be providing some more of that later. Um, in conformance with our standards, we document all analysis and research um, uh, so that we can meet our standards and cite every sentence of our report later to the actual um, factual documents. Uh, to date, we've completed 25 work papers, and we have another 11 in progress, plus the data analysis that we're working on. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, the three agents. Uh, just a moment. Um, so you have a question on what's been covered? Go ahead, Representative yeah, Gray. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I know you're just the messenger here, but it, you always want you to be given the information. So your time is, is well spent and our time, we, we get something out of this and ultimately the taxpayers with their investment in, in, in LSO is, is getting a product that is going to help, help everybody. I mean, this whole thing about privileged communications, I mean, this is, this is the Wyoming, it, it's the Wyoming state legislature. What, what, what's the reason why we wouldn't have access to that? So they're basically saying that the executive branch is exerting privilege over these contracts? I mean, is there a position that only the AG can look at this? Can other agencies look at it? Is it, is it the executive branch as a whole and not the legislature? In, in which case, you know, I really question that. What, what is, what, what's the grounds for, for what they're saying? So um, thank you, Representative Gray. So this, this does have some complexity to it. Ms. Bodewins um, is, of course, an attorney and has been dealing with this. So we'll let her respond to it. And then we may have a follow-up later in the day on this particular issue. Okay. So go ahead, Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray. So they're asserting um, 
attorney-client privileged on communications, which could include contract edits that um, they made in the file to their client agencies, that attorney-client relationship between the attorneys at the attorney, attorney general's office and the client agencies. Now that's a common law privilege that's it's also within the courts, the judicial, judicial branch. Um, so there are some ways that we're trying to explore to get around this. It's not, the issue right now is the attorney general cannot waive that privilege. That is, that's the law. It has to be the client that waives that privilege if, if there's a privilege there. Now, there's a question as to whether our statutes can get us there. Um, there's also a question of whether we can just go to the client and they can give us this stuff. Um, so we're kind of exploring that right now. And we're also exploring, do we even need this stuff to complete the audit? Um, we don't wanna fight about something that perhaps we can work around. So I think, there, so just to be clear, um, so Ms. Bode, there, there is an ongoing discussion about this. There are avenues. The most important question is, do we need the information to actually do the evaluation? I mean, is it so pertinent? And that, that we're not clear at that yet. So, the, I mean, there is ongoing discussions um, going with between LSO, Attorney General's Office, and the agencies. Um, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The problem with that argument is that it's almost circular. We, we, we can't know whether it's pertinent until we see it. So, <laughs> so there's no way of knowing. Is, is if you thought about a statutory fix, and I want to be clear here, I'm not in any way wanting any amendment to attorney-client privilege uh, for private individuals. But now this is the second audit in a row that we've had issues getting data within government. And so is there a way we could amend the statute, Ms. Budowins, and maybe we could talk during this, uh, looks like we're gonna have pretty long lunch uh, to get a bill draft going. I don't know if we're gonna have another meeting before session, but to, to just help this committee do its work as we're trying to get the audit function going again after you know three years where we, we've been, struggling to find what uh, what this looks like in you know in the third decade of, of this of this century i mean because we we've kind of changed the way this this committee looks so it, not necessarily have to answer that but if there's a way we could look at the statute because it i, I just think it's going to continue to be an issue and it seems like the executive branch is there's just seems to be problems and and it's um, getting to be a problem Ms. Budowins, please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, um, I guess I'll start. I don't know the data access issues in the previous audit. Uh, they, I don't think it was attorney client privilege. Now, the water development audit that was five years ago, they had an issue that was raised with attorney client privilege. Um, I, don't, I don't know what ultimately happened, but that it, what, this isn't the first audit where this has been raised. However, you know, we talk about changing the statute there. The first question is, what does the statute currently allow us? And we have received confidential attorney client. Um, memorandums and letters and previous audits, we found those. Um, so I don't, if it's the current attorney general's interpretation, um, but then there's also, we've, we have started the work of polling other states to see what their statutes look like in terms of their access statutes. And I, Carla looked at this and there's a handful that do include privileged and confidential information. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One more question here as we dig dig deeper here. Can you remind me, is this currently a full-fledged audit or is this an evaluation paper to lead to authorization to a full-fledged audit? Ms. Bodewitz. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, this is a full, we're fully authorized to begin the audit. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have been having, continuing to have discussions, the chairman, vice chairman and myself have been conferring with um, Ms. Bodewins about whether we're getting wh where we are in that information gathering and when do we do need to, I guess, for lack of a term, say, okay, we need additional authority or are we not getting what we need? So it's, we're still having those, they're still trying to get their arms around it. One of the things I'll just be candid with you, one of the reasons we're maybe at this point right now is we don't have as much is because we had a special session in Reading and our staff got pulled away from some of their audit and other things to take care of that. And now they're preparing for a budget session. So we've, we've 
their, their time has been stretched. So some of this has not been put on the back burner, but it's just been supplanted with things that were more immediate. It's just, I'm just being candid with you. They, they're, they're, they're part of the staff, they get tasked to do things. Um, and that happens after the upcoming session, which we'll talk about as well. So thank you, Ms. Bodewins. So I think, go ahead and please proceed with uh, where, you, where you were, Ms. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Gray. Um, as I was um, showing you, these are the engaged um, agencies that we have so far. Also, after session, we'll be conducting state agencies. We'll be engaging them as well as boards and commissions to a certain degree because we'll be conducting our sample of contracts on certain agencies and we'll be doing the case file review with those agencies and talking to, um, to agency officials as well. So, um, so they'll be selected per our, our methodology for our case sample. Um, next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so more about what we're looking at in the preliminary scope is that we'll be um, um, con uh, looking at contracting to determine the extent that it protects the state. In doing that, we'll be examining the state contracting process to determine what degree it is effective and efficient. Uh, so those are our two preliminary questions. We've identified three phases of the contract process. First is the negotiation drafting phase. Second is the approval process phase. And third is the compliance or monitoring phase. Um, looking at all three of these areas through the lens of whether each is effective and efficient. The considerations that we have so far in going through these questions is the data availability. And as you've known from um, prior evaluations, that's always a, a consideration. Um, we've received data already from ANI on their master contracts list. Um, and so that's fully available. We had intentioned, uh, our intention was to have the examination period from 2016 through 2021. But then um, we, we have two considerations that have made us modify that just a little bit. First of all, the um, ETS new system that went online for their contract management um, went live in September. So it doesn't look like any of the data time period that we're gonna be looking at contracts will be available in their new system. So because their old system is degrading and it may not be available, you know, whenever it fails, um, they've offered to take the contract numbers that we want and they'll pull manually, pull up um, the contract data, do a screenshot and give that to us. Then we'll need to enter that manually into a, a data analysis form. So we can do that, but there's no way that we can look at all the contracts that ETS has for, um, for IT projects that way. Um, also, when we talk to um, a, um, the AG's office, they've gone ahead and, and gone to a, a brand new system that is um, compliant with reporting and has incredible functionality. That went live in 2018. So prior to that, their old heat system, if you're familiar with it, it, it doesn't have the capacity to do reporting or searching in the methodology that we would desire. So we contra uh, contracted our time period to go to 2018 through 2021. That still should give us a sufficient period of time to look at this, especially we'll have some time prior to COVID because that kind of skews things a little bit, but we should be good. So I just wanted to let you know what our time period is that we're looking at contracts. And there are a lot of contracts. Um, so that's where we are on the data availability. Uh, availability, excuse me. <laughs> and second of all, we don't want to duplicate the last evaluation report that we did on state procurement and leasing. We know there are components of procurement that are so tightly woven into the contract, such as the negotiation that we will be looking at, but we don't want to duplicate that evaluation. And this does come from, um, this evaluation does come kind of out of um, recommendation 3.3 .3 
um, to consider doing an evaluation on the agency contracting process. So we're trying not to duplicate that. We're trying to augment it by looking at the contracting process, which you directed us to do. Also, when looking at ETS, they completed a comprehensive review on their procurement and also their availability to move from a transactional organization to an enterprise-wide organization and those levels of what they call business maturity. So we don't want to duplicate what the legislature spent a lot of money on to do their consulting study. So we're, we're maintaining that we're looking at the contracting processes, which has also been where we've identified um, through conversations in the committee, you've uh, indicated that there are concerns with that. So um, just so you know wh where we are with those areas. Um, we'll be following the statutory requirements um, as part of our scope. So that will be integral into, uh, as far as our criteria and what directs us to look at what part of the processes. Also, we have uh, um, worked on our scope to make sure that we are following the items that you have mentioned that um, you had major concern over. And so that directs our scope to make sure that we're looking at those sole source and non-negotiated bids because those are a higher risk. And um, with valuations, you always try to identify the high risk items to make sure that um, those are following audit procedures and that they're handled correctly. So that would be in our case, effectively and efficiently. So we, did it, oh, so we are scoping out those items that are under an RFP at this point. And um, if you want us to look at that later, we can certainly do that. Okay, thank you very much. Resident Gray, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that we've talked a lot about you know, it's been a management audit, appropriations, management council is the electronic sort of databases, all these things, and every agency's got one, repositories. And there were some comments at, at a previous meeting, I actually think Senator Guru made them, about the RFP process and that being abused on some of these electronic asks, which have been really increased in frequency. And you know it's very important we do the bidding process, but it, it seems like this RFP process sometimes isn't working. So one of the things that I think maybe you can look at is is specifically the electronic side. You know, I mean, all all the all these databases, all this, uh, you know, all, everything interact. You know, repositories and these wide out asks for the RIS system. I mean. It's just we we've had a hard time getting a handle on that on that question, and so I, I'm not sure that's sort of a sub thing, but but it's another thing maybe you could look at. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, we are definitely looking at the electronic processes as they relate to contracting. That is a, a critical aspect for us to look at. So thank you for reiterating that. So I think. Um, Ms. Smith, I think uh, just a step beyond, or maybe a clarifying point, I think it's electronic processes, but I think actually what Representative Gray is also talking about, it, uh, thinking back to Senator Guru's um, comments, was technology contracts, specifically for databases and for all the various agencies that have standalone or um, things, and, we're, and whether we're getting the um, adequate amount of coordination, understanding, et cetera, between the independent agency or agencies and ETS in this contracting process, which subsequently comes to the legislature for funding. Um, I think that is part of what um, Representative Gray was trying to get to. So this is a maybe a subset within the contracting sphere that I think Representative Gray and, and Senator Guru before thought maybe if there was something unique about it or something in the process, to your point about process, that we could examine and that, that would be helpful to know, know if we're actually getting the best values out of these, out of that particular type of contracting for that particular type of service and um, hardware software. 
I, I think I'm summarizing kind of what the interest is. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Yes, we will be doing a judgmental sample on uh, IT technology, those kinds of large IT projects. Thank you. Yep, uh, follow up, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the latitude too, just trying to find the appropriate spaces to make these suggestions. But the other thing in terms of the, you know, the, the guidance that is in these audits and I haven't gone through a full one as a member, but I've read some of the previous ones. But in the past, we, you had those those clear suggestions, even statutory suggestions. And one of them that I'm really interested in and off the management council discussions we've been having, every single one of these agencies has a different IT uh, repository, different technology, this, that, and the other thing. And, and the whole point of ETS is to centralize, you know, not just the maintenance of their computers or whatever, um, to have someone to come over to manage their computers, but all of this technology really is supposed to be, you know, to get efficiencies. We're, that, that's why it's centralized. So I, I just, it hasn't happened. And then decoupling it is very difficult because every agency has their own repository. Every agency has system X. They've already contracted out for it until it comes up again. And they all have service contracts attached to them. So how do we convert this into a centralized thing that can ultimately save millions of dollars? I mean, what's the process where we can do that? Ultimately, you're probably gonna to have to look at the contracts to do that and they're gonna exert this privilege, which I think is a, is a huge issue. But anyway, this is something we've been talking about because LSO wants to have a repository. Well. Why can't they feed into the, the dozens that all these agencies have that really should be housed in ETS? I mean, that, that's the point of it. Just like we're doing centralization on HR and we're going to be talking about later. And so just another suggestion, how can we do that? And I'm not sure the answer is that easy. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Representative Gray, at, um, if you can remember that entire soliloquy at 3.15, Department of Enterprise Technologies will be here, which we are the home committee for. And so, I mean, I'm not, I don't know that we need to put uh, Ms. Smith and her team on the spot for that particular question within the contracting question. I think that's fair. But for the broader topic, I think um, we'll have the new chief information officer here and deputy chief officer here this afternoon. And I think that absolutely they're here for an update. And I think that's a, uh, if, you, if you don't mind bringing that same eloquence this afternoon and yes. letting Ms. Smith off the hook for the moment. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't know that. I think you are talking about something that is bigger than what we're getting into with the Z-Val. They're going to look into some of the details of it. I think that the policy questions and that stuff is, I think something, I think it is a very fair question for the executive branch that's responsible for it. So thank you, Ms. Smith. If you want to respond to any of that, please do so. Otherwise you're welcome to proceed. Uh, I think I heard somebody from the very far west of the state. Uh, is that Senator Guru? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, couldn't agree with you more on your, your comments about what's going to happen at 315. And I actually think uh, the good representative's comments um, are well, well, well taken. And I think they're going to have some answers and <clears throat> be talking about that. But I wanted to go back, and I'm sorry, I tried to raise my hand earlier about this whole um, question of uh, how we can get around this uh, legal conundrum with the, with the first floor, the chief executive and privilege. Um, and some of the um, tenant committees I serve on, we um, actually use, use, um, use the uh, what is the open meeting statutes to talk about in private talk about some of these contracts and talk about that and maybe that may be a way to bridge this is just a suggestion here to try to bridge that that divide and not uh, violate and I think that maybe if you talk to the folks down on the first floor that that may be part of their problem is just not having that stuff in the public realm some of their negotiating and some of that, that maybe that might help. I don't know. I was just throwing that out there as a possible solution uh, without, you know, going to, going to uh, any farther uh, 
statutory changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's anything to respond to there, Ms. Smith, just carry on. If, if there's something you wanna to respond to, you're welcome to otherwise carry on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, Senator Guru, appreciate that. Um, we will be looking at best practices, which include repositories and, and document management. Um, so we should be addressing that to a certain degree, as well as whatever you want to um, ask ETS this afternoon. And um, to Senator Guru, we are pursuing other avenues um, behind the scenes to uh, mitigate um, the situation and to work collaboratively and uh, um, with the AG and, and make our needs met as well as theirs. Thank you. Thank you. So if I may continue. Please do. Okay. Um, so the first question is as to the effectiveness. And we have these sub questions or these focus questions. Um, is the state contracting conducted in accordance with the statutory intent? That's always the first question. Then are contracts effectively negotiated and drafted? Are structuring the financial terms and incentives um, appropriate? as well as the performance measures and looking at alternative me methods to improve the contract negotiations. Also, when looking at the effectiveness of the monitoring and the compliance, we'll be addressing and looking at monitoring of financial terms and conditions, monitoring the performance measures, those are also called the deliverables, for both the agency and the contracted par party or the vendor, and also the future myth uh, risk mitigation, which would be um, legal action afterwards. Then as we look at um, the efficiency question, this mostly focuses on phase two on the contract approvals. And so we've identified um, the following aspects to, uh, to um, study. Um, is the contract approval process efficient? Is the allocation of responsibilities appropriate and sufficient? Uh, looking at the approval timeframe for each contract, the reasons if there are delays, looking at those performance measures on um, what they're supposed to get done, when they get it done and, and how it's done. Also, does the state have adequate resources for efficient contracting? And those would be um, as far as staffing, training and the satisfactory systems contract tracking, storage, and monitoring um, for Representative Gray. Um, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think one of the, the struggles in this audit is going to be that each agency is obviously different. So you have these, these broad questions, but then you have some policy questions maybe we can get at in some of these agencies. So we talked about some of the IT stuff, but Another one that I've been really interested in is, is the YDOT end. So uh, use of uh, waivers on, on by YDOT, use of contract increases within the process, so bidding low, and then doing uh, whatever they're called, extensions or whatever as, as you move through, what are those called? Change orders, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Bouchard. Yeah, that's, that's use of change orders on YDOT. And then also use of performance guarantees on roads. I mean, that, uh, some states do that. Obviously, it makes the contract more expensive. But you know, if 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 the the road's defective, and we're replacing it in in you know every in in a frequency that is that is not efficient, ultimately those guarantees could be uh, could be very. Uh, a route that we want to consider. So as you consider the, the policy questions here for that, which is really interesting for, in terms of how the committee interacts with this report, I think YDOT is another one where you could, I wanted to bring out some of those, some of those questions that maybe we're hoping to have answered. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. So you, you men mentioned several things in there earlier that was mentioned sole source and non-negotiable. Negotiated waivers, I think, actually speaks to both of those and change orders and performance guarantees are actually terms of a contract, it would seem to me. So those will be looked at. So I think maybe the question for, um, that comes out of Representative Gray's comment, comments are, is YDOT or a YDOT type contracts part of what 
you will be able to audit or get a sample of in your, your audit process. Ms. 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 Smith, Mrs. Smith, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman Barlow and Representative Gray. Uh, well, right now, um, we still haven't determined our sample. Uh, YDOT has some different processes. Um, and traditionally, they didn't go through the AG, um, but we will be, we haven't totally excluded anybody from, from our sample population at this point. And um, if the committee has significant questions about YDOT, we'll take that into consideration for certain. So I think you may, maybe heard there would be some interest in that. If it, certainly if it's unique, we'd have interest in it, I think. And, um, and then if there's a sample that could be pulled out of that, because it is a very large um, component of what would be contracted for the state of Wyoming on an annual basis. So keep that in consideration as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gray. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was moving into the um, evaluation criteria and best practices. And this is where we compare what is currently happening, happening in the state of Wyoming and compare it to what would be the paradigm, what would be the best way to be the most efficient and effective and, and make sure that the state is um, not at risk. So that criteria that we're using as a comparator for potential findings and recommendations are the Wyoming statutes, the contracting best practices. We also look at other states that have contracting practices that are successful or held out as, as um, optimal. We'll also be using um, the state manuals, policies, training materials, and checklists for the agencies and the three entities that we're looking at. Um, to make sure that one, that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing per their own criteria. And then we'll be looking at that criteria to see if that is the best criteria for doing things. So it's kind of a two prong question when we look at best practices. Also a number of other states uh, evaluation functions have done contracting um, evaluations and they offer um, good points uh, to investigate, to study, and also possible options that we may wish to consider. So uh, we'll be reviewing the data to develop the appropriate methodology for the sampling, and then we'll go into um, to our field work. So, so, so Ms. Smith, if yes. I, might, I might ask, um, so when you named off the three agencies, A&I, ETS, and the Attorney General, actually, Two of those are, they're all kind of interdependent. So if there's going to be a, let's say a best practices or a manual, um, it would seem like one would be providing it to others for different reasons, i.e. the attorney general might be providing it to all agencies based on you know, what, what they advise as a contracting standards, let's say. A&I might be doing it for a different purpose. ETS might be doing it from, from the uh, information technology side is best practices. So there's an interconnectedness in this that it seems like we're gonna have some, so I guess my, my point would be is that some are, are going to be advising others and some are gonna be receiving advice and they're gonna be doing it in different, in, in different capacities depending on the, on the contracting um, topic, let's say or material. So I, I, that adds a little level of complexity, but with these particular agencies, these are, these are probably the main players as, as, as that interconnectedness. So I think it's really important to understand how they're advising, how their best practices they're already using and how they fit with quote unquote best practices as they advise. That would be at least my thought. And then you, how it applies to agencies or other departments you know, certainly is important too, but there's almost a, almost a circular thing to use a term that my colleague likes, almost circular that these folks are actually advising each other on advising each other, depending on the topic of, of, of interest. So anyway, keep that in mind as you proceed, at least from my perspective. Thank you, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, you're exactly right. There is a lot of moving parts and there a lot of interconnectedness in this as well as um, within the agencies themselves. So we will, we will be taking your considerations and um, following that. Thank you, so, please proceed. Okay, so um, as I said, our next steps are to finalize the preliminary planning and scoping documents. So we're just about done with that phase. Um, we're just waiting on those additional documents. 
then um, we'll be pausing the evaluation for the 2022 legislative session as we'll be helping um, run committee meetings during that session and then doing the interim topics and uh, preparing to move forward. After that, when we get back right after the session, we'll get back into our evaluation and we'll develop what we call a fieldwork plan. And it's designed to gather the evidence to specific objectives. So we'll have some from this initial information that we have, we'll, we'll flag certain things that we think that, um, that we've seen that really need to be identified more carefully and that are probably problematic or issues. And then we'll devise a way to make sure that we have the proper evidence to say, yes, it is an issue. No, it's not an issue. What is the cause? And is there a way that we can address this issue? That's how we do findings and recommendations. After we develop that fieldwork plan, then we'll carry it out. And um, that will include doing a survey to all the executive branch agencies, boards and commissions on their contracting process, because we wanna to speak to the entire process as well as um, to a sample, um, a targeted sample. So um, they'll also do interviews. We'll be doing interviews with the engaged agencies as well as the sample agencies and other stakeholders that we find necessary. We'll be doing the data analysis as well as the agency contract document review and case file reviews. So we won't just be looking at the contract at the agencies, but we'll be looking at their file management to, to help us understand you know, the timelines and, and what goes into the negotiations and, and where things are. So um, after we get done with that, then we finalize our recommendations and our findings and our recommendations and we'll do the report writing and that's very, um, um, detailed in our methodology. And we'll, um, because we have engaged three agencies, we'll have three exit conferences by statute where we give them 15 days to respond to the draft re confidential report. And then we'll meet with them during that 15 days, each one separately, go over the report with them and address their concerns that we may or may not make changes, but let them tell us what um, they think might be tone differences or, or something along those lines. Um, then we'll provide it a draft, a draft report to the committee a couple of weeks in advance of having our meeting where we'll provide that to you in executive session. So you can ask us questions and then we'll bring in the agencies um, and they'll still be in executive session. So you can have a frank and um, honest conversation with them too about the entire processes and any other questions you may have before you vote on it. Um, so then I think that uh, takes care of our little slide presentation and update and any other questions that you may have, I'll try to address those. All right, so I guess I have one question. There's um, many next steps. Give us a, a timeline when you, I mean, I, I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but I, I wanna know, are we looking about something like toward the end of this coming interim, we would have a report that we would, would be actionable. And if there are recommendations for the succeeding legislature or for whoever that those would be available. So give me a timeline. Ms. Bodewins, you're welcome to weigh in too. I know <laughs> um, you may want not want to pressure your staff, but I mean, we really do, I really do wanna know kind of what we're looking at for a timeline where we're gonna get you know, things back for this committee to take up. Please uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, we definitely plan to have this done over the summer. Um, we will be having a, one of our members will be adding a new member to our evaluation team <laughs> this summer. So um, we might be without her services for a while, but um, Clarissa is, is excellent we, and she's been through all the training and everything as well as Amanda. So we should be able to, to move forward with that even with um, Amanda uh, working from home to do some review. So we anticipate getting to the writing portion hopefully in July or August um, if, if there aren't a lot of things that pull us away from this again. So that's, that's our intent to have something to you for your meeting um, well in advance of the legislative session so that you can do bill drafts 
if you if you feel necessary and that you can work those bill drafts and present them at the next session. Okay, Does so that answer I, your question? I think I think so. So you think there will be a complete um, audit or this this will be completed and available to the public should the committee advance it that far by first of September time frame? Is that is that that's our goal? I, I mean that's your goal. And so okay. Uh, it may right. not be Abby's goal. <laughs> uh, Ms. Bodwins, if you want to weigh in, that's Mr. Fine. Chairman, um, I think we definitely are shooting for next fall, early fall, to have this done. Um, okay. We're we're a I'm we're further behind than I thought we would be, simply due to the ability to get information. Um, that it's taken some time, and if we keep running into these issues, as we talked previously with attorney-client privilege stuff, my goal is to still get you a report by next fall. And if we have to cut things and simply reduce it down to a policy analysis. That's something, those are issues we can carry on later, but I want this committee to have a report before the end of the committee. Okay, thank you very much. All right, any um, committee, any other uh, questions on this first evaluation update? Go ahead, Representative Gray. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th this is really important. We get this right and excited about this audit, and it's really the heart of what the Management Audit Committee does. I think there's a couple things maybe this committee can do to help in, in the drafting of this audit to get a product that is really, really gonna be something the legislature can interact with on a policy perspective. One, I think that when they draft the initial scoping paper, which I think seems like it's probably gonna come at definitely after session, I, I do think we should reconvene and review that. And, and in the interim, talk to the LSO about some of the specific agency questions we might have that are outside of these broader, uh, I, I would say broader overall questions that were, that were on two slides ago. Cause I do think there's some agency things as they, if they're gonna look at this data that could be enormously helpful uh, to this process. And uh, I, I think we should make sure to try to take advantage of that while they're looking at that. So I think it would be really good for us to have communication uh, as we always do, but also to come back and pretty quickly after session or around when they think the scoping paper is going to be done and review that before they really dig into the data. And that leads to the second point is I think we really need to nail down in, in the afternoon these data issues because it, it's really a problem when they can't, when we're asking them to, to evaluate data and they can't, they can't get it. So. Ms. Bodwin's any comments or any thoughts? Um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify, we are long past the scoping phase of, of a scoping paper. Um, that would have done before the audit was even authorized. Um, so there will, there will not be a scoping paper um, on this audit. The next step for us is the field work plan, um, which is, is very fine. detailed as to exactly what we go into and what evidence we'll be gathering to answer each specific objective. Okay, thank you. Representative Gray, did you have a follow-up? Or Mr. Okay. Chairman, yeah. So what is meant by that first bullet point on next steps? Finalize preliminary planning and scoping documents and work papers. Go ahead, Ms. Smith or, or Ms. Bodwins. Ms. Smith, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Gray, uh, it's internal scoping documents. It's like what we're going to look at, like we're going to for our sample, we're going to scope out the University of Wyoming because they have their own process. It's um, scoping out things like federal contracts because they're already audited. So it's internal scoping as far as, and our work papers of all of our documents. So we're finalizing those scoping items um, to make sure that we have um, the the right group that we're going to look at to develop our methodology for our sample. I'm sorry if there was confusion. It We use scoping and we use survey in so many ways that it really is dependent on the context. Thank you, Ms. Um, Smith. Ms. Bodewins. Mr. Chairman, I would add that um, specifically what that's referring to is we have these preliminary planning worksheets and it's an Excel spreadsheet that's pretty detailed. This PowerPoint was pulled directly from that. Um, so you really are seeing when we went through the efficiency and the effectiveness, those kind of focus questions that is coming from those internal documents. This was just a more effective way to give you that information. Thank you. Um, any further questions on the first evaluation update? So we got 15 minutes left. 
we've got two scoping scoping papers as opposed to internal scoping processes. Um, up next, is it adequate to go through those? We have time to go through those or do you want to, um, Ms. Bodewins, what's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I think it's um, Ms. Lanta was going to rejoin the meeting and I can check and see if she's here. Um, okay, we go thank to you. Go ahead. Um, so members of the committee and the public, uh, Ms. Lanto, I believe had comments in the last section and I was not paying attention to the hand raises. So she might've had comments regarding the um, bills that we were working. So I wanted, I offered if she had comments that she could certainly rejoin us and make those comments. So if she is available, we'll be pleased to receive her thoughts. Mr. Chairman, she should be in the meeting now. Hello, Ms. Lanta, are you with us? Do you have audio and video capability? Ms. Lanta. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Welcome. My apologies if I overlooked you um, earlier. We're we're uh, eager to take your comments on our some of our previous bills and actions. Uh, Ms. Lanta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you um, giving me the privilege to uh, join back in. I think I inadvertently unconnected my um, uh, or I had raised my hand earlier and inadvertently unraised it. Um, I, I just wanted in order to not have a continuing problem with the whole uh, issue of unreported um, or non-reporting special districts on the cost of government report. I, I just did want to offer that in researching the uh, non-reporting entities that were special districts on this current uh, report, um, all eight of them were under subject of some kind of dissolution, six by um, the counties. And um, uh, I think there is a gap when the dissolution process is taken. For instance, the ones that were done in Washakie, and, and I don't fault the county I, or the, um, the county because I believe they did all the procedures exactly the way they were supposed to uh, according to their minutes. The gap comes in is that once they were dissolved, still left the issue of inactive with an inactive um, special district, there was no one to do the final cost of government report or the census report that would that feeds the cost of government. So it, it would be like a perpetual problem anytime there are uh, inactive special districts. And uh, my observation, just reading through the process and, and the process that was correctly taken by the um, County of Washakie is, is that to me, it might make sense that as part of the di dissolution, the official dissolution process, when it's uh, initiated by a board of county commissioners, um, that the commission or the commission that they appoint as the last director of these districts would be the appropriate person to file um, that, that final report. Um, according to uh, information I had gotten from Rich Cummings earlier this year, um, specifically asking why we require a dissolved entity to report in their final year. If a district is dissolved after July 1st of any given year, the entity is still required to provide a report of the entity's activities to the Department of Audit for the period between July 1st and dissolution date. Generally, this report would be zero on everything. However, there are instances where there is a transfer of remaining assets to another entity, which is what appears to ha have happened, at least specifically in the, in the Washakie dissolutions. And it, it seems to me at that point, the only entity with the authority and the information to file that report on a inactive special district would be uh, the Board of County Commissioners. Um, so I was offering that for consideration of, of if there's another way to do it. Certainly, 
I, as an uninterested party, can't step in and do it. I wouldn't have the information to, to do it with. So that was my comment on that, sir. Thank you, Ms. Lanza. So I think um, Ms. Ms. Bodwin's maybe make a note of that and we should circle back. You, you said you got that, or you had that discussion with Mr. Cummings, the Department of Audit, is that accurate? Yes, earlier this year when I was questioning why, I mean, I, I would point out that all the districts that were on the report were inactive division uh, districts. Um, and I believe that it's, it helped foster the impression that there are just, that in general, there is a special district non-reporting problem where in this case, it's it's where districts were inactive and didn't have a board to to fill out that paperwork. Okay, thank you. I, I, I do appreciate that nuance and uh, maybe some, something that um, I will take up as uh, if the bill and as the bill proceeds through the session, we'll maybe look at a way to visit with the um, Department of Audit. So it gives them some, this goes, I guess, to that administrative latitude that they would be able to say, um, you know, this was somehow dissolved and how was that dissolved and and then remove that from that report. Um, so any questions for Ms. Lanta? Any questions for Ms. Lanta? Ms. Lanta, thank you very much. Anything further? No, sir. And again, thank you for the privilege of rejoining the meeting. But, and my apologies again for not recognizing your, your uh, interest earlier um, and when we were on that topic. So my thank you for your patience. All right, um, Ms. Bodewins, we're back on uh, number eight or number nine agenda, agenda item. What do you think about the economic development tools scoping paper and the property tax assessments scape, scoping paper? You want to just give us an update of those as they were requested in August? And, and just so folks know, we don't have to exhaust it here. We can have further discussion this afternoon if there's lots of questions. I, I know Ms. Sherwood has uh, handed out something that she's of interest in. I know the second one is of interest to uh, Representative Gray particularly. So Ms. Bodewins, let's just at least get the groundwork started and then we'll, if we need to circle back later, we can. Thank you, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, those two items um, I put on here, they have not been started because the staff have been fully dedicated to the eval was waiting for a slow moment with another research analyst that they could start those because they're essentially background papers. Um, I'm hoping once the kind of interim committee white papers die down after May, June area, we can dive into those. Um, I wanted to at least get them back in front of the committee in case priorities in terms of prioritization and interest. Okay, so members, um, th this goes down to the workload of our staff and what they've had this past fall, what they have ahead of them and, and where things get um, put in this. So what we have before you is you have two things that have already been requested and um, they're, they're in the planning stages and we are getting to them. And then we've had three or, three or four other things that have been brought to the forefront. So probably the discussion we'll have this afternoon is, are these two, uh, is the ones that were requested in August, still a priority to this committee? If they are, they will, continue to move march forward. And if there's, I, I'm cautious to add anything additional to it. So really it would be, are these still a priority? And if they're not, what would you like to replace one of them with? Because this is basically setting us up potentially for the next evaluation. This is the groundwork that's done so that we can have a subsequent evaluation that would start hopefully by next fall. Um, as we're considering bills based off of the first one or actions, responses to the first or, or, or um, say contracting one, then staff can, scoping will be done, we hope, and they can say, we'll make a pull the trigger on something. So that's what we're trying to do is set up a continuum of, of work for our staff to do as, as they have time. So um, does anybody have any questions immediately where we are? And maybe this afternoon, we just, we, re, we circle back to this, visit about it, see where we are. Is Rep. Senator Guru, did you have something? Nope, okay. Anyone else on the committee have any discussion right now on this? We will circle back to this at the end of the day um, and um, at exactly 345. No, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> no, we, we, will, we will circle back to it. If you wanna have any discussion on any of this right now, we can, but what the, really the question is, is getting an update from Ms. Bodewins on these two things are still in the hopper. 
do you want to replace them with something else and reprioritize or something? Um, and we can do that later. If, if that's, I just want to give you, that kind of gives us the framework for what our discussion could be this afternoon. Any discussion on that? All right, with that members, we are four minutes ahead, four minutes ahead of our noon recess for lunch. And so we will stand in recess and if there's no further business at this time, we'll stand in recess until 1 p.m. And at 1 p.m. we're gonna start with our a &I state leasing update. Uh, Director Bach will be here and then we'll proceed through um, the rest of our day's agenda. So thank you very much to those in the public that have joined us and we will reconvene at one o'clock.